SportsRadioDetroit.com. SRD on SportsRadioDetroit.com. Hello and welcome to the latest edition of Lions SRD here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. I'm Ben Slaggy, joined with always the man from Pittsburgh, PA, just outside of Marty Stouffer. Marty, the season is back. I know you were double screening it on Sunday. You had the Steelers and Lions both playing. Are you, and I know you're. You said you're a little bit more of a NFL guy more than a college guy, right? Yes. So you were, you were like a pig in slop on Sunday, weren't you? I was uh, because you know I, I've never given the Steelers a fair shake because the Steelers fan base absolutely drives me nuts. But, I'm, but and plus, like they've always had players that I just couldn't stand. So this year, I decided to kind of give them a fair shake and kind of you know, I'd, I'd pay a little more attention. Plus, they've got T.J. Watt, who we all know, if you listen to this podcast, that I was really high on. So I really wanted to see what he can do. So I was like, well, I'm going to watch both games as soon as I can figure out how to do it. And sure enough, I actually did it. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> and T.J. Watt did not disappoint you, my friend. What was it, two sacks, an interception, and like seven tackles or something like that? Yeah, yeah, he was he was outstanding, uh, just, just like our own Jared Davis was. I mean, both guys were above and beyond what, the, what I figured they would do. It was, it was great. Yeah, Jared David, Davis was the first Lions rookie linebacker to start a game since uh, Chris Spielman back in, I believe it was 89. So that was impressive. And one thing that was actually kind of really, really impressive, the, the Lions defense, speaking of Davis, looked arguably dominant. Now, I know like anyone that was watching their fair share of football – on Thursday, Sunday, even on Monday, not everyone looked crisp. Don't get me wrong, but it got to a point where the Lions were almost starting to neutralize uh, David Johnson. You know, they were pressuring Carson Palmer without a true dominant pass rusher because Ziggy Ansah was basically playing on a pitch count. He was playing a, a limited number of snaps as he was being eased into everything after taking the entire preseason off, healing with his uh, ankle injury. You know, he's been bothered with a knee before. So they wanted to make sure he was healthy, and it made sense. But this Lions defense, they if you were watching any of the preseason games, Chris Spielman basically spoke at nauseum about how the Lions wanted to be more opportunistic on, this, on defense. And my God, were they. I mean, Miles Killebrew had a pick six. There was a couple of interceptions. There was, you know, forced fumbles. Granted, Lions didn't, you know, recover both of them, but they recovered one of them. This defense had four turnovers, Marty, four turnovers when they only caused three turnovers in, in games all of last season. It was against the Jags in Week 11, and then a couple of weeks later, against the Saints on the road where the Lions did look dominant uh, even when Matthew Stafford had that hurt finger. 
But this was the first time in two years the Lions' defense caused four turnovers. To me, it was impressive to see how well this defense held Arizona in check. Arizona does have weapons. You know, they have still a respectable quarterback, even though Carson Palmer, who looked every bit of 38, you know, wasn't really great. But they forced three interceptions out of him. The defense looked really, really good. It, it looked like a competent defense for the first time in a couple of years. Now, granted, under Rod Marinelli, the Lions always had a very good defensive front four, and then that kind of helped out the linebackers, but the secondary was terrible. But when you look at what happened on Sunday, all the units basically played equal. The defensive line played pretty okay. They played solid. Linebackers played solid. And then the secondary played very, very solid. It, it was it was a nice, complete defensive effort at least that's what I saw what did you see on Sunday that impressed you about the defense uh same thing uh you know I wanted to see how that defensive line was going to react with with Ziggy as you said basically being on a pitch count and I and I mean we all know that I'm pulling for Anthony Zettel but I mean Ashawn Robinson was outstanding granted a lot of his stuff didn't show up on the stat sheet but he clogged a lot of holes and David Johnson had to get creative and he didn't he wasn't always able to you know uh Haloti Nada looked good um that whole defensive line looked really, really strong. And it was just, like you said, there was no true number one pass rush or whatever, however you worded it. And you know what? You're right. But that, that defensive line bullied, bullied that Arizona offensive line pretty much that entire game. And I was really, really happy about that. Yeah, I mean, they looked physical. You know, they <laughs> they were not only causing turnovers, they they were being opportunistic, aggressive, you know, physical. They injured David Johnson you know, they, he, they kind of hurt his wrist on the first uh, strip that they had on him. And then, as you, as you said, Ashawn Robinson, Mr. All Over the Place, teleporting from scene to scene, it seemed like. He he caused uh, one fumble with Gerard Davis, and Davis picked it up and returned it, and the Lions were able to capitalize off of it immediately, which was basically the turning point in the game. The Lions gave up a touchdown, and – the Lions needed to get back in it. It was 17-9, to and that's when Matthew Stafford hit Theo Riddick for that seven-yard touchdown pass to quickly turn that one around. The only thing that was really weird about that, though, is that they went for two. And yeah, I and, thought that was strange, too. Yeah, I was going to say, it didn't really make sense. didn't make sense on the flow of the game a little bit. You know, if you, if you make the extra point, which they did miss, because at that point, Casey Redford was already injured. Jake Rudock, not used to... Uh, holding the football wasn't really prepared as well and that's why they missed uh, the extra point so I, I guess from that sense it made sense but yeah I mean you didn't you didn't need to do it granted it didn't come back to bite the Lions in in uh, you know the foot or anything like that that they, they were able to recover and have a dominant fourth quarter which it seems like this Lions team just loves the fourth quarter that, that, for whatever reason now, because granted the Lions still trailed, entering the fourth quarter, it was 17-15. The Lions, yet again, with another comeback win in the fourth quarter, and Kenny Galladay was a big reason for that. A guy that I know the last time on, on uh, this show, and even on the road show, because if you were on Twitter, I got grief for it. I expressed concern not worry because there's different levels and that's why there's different words for different levels of what you can go through as an emotion like you can be angry you can be pissed you can be livid you know granted they all kind of mean the same thing but they're different levels and tones of the word but that's why I was concerned because this was a guy we talked about it he was electric against the Colts and then disappeared only caught one uh, pass and in game uh, two and three and didn't play in the fourth game. So we didn't know what Galladay was going to do. I mean, you could you could have hopes he was going to reemerge like the guy that we saw in Indianapolis. And granted, that would have been fantastic. And pretty much he did. I mean, the 45-yard touchdown pass that he caught where he laid out for the football was beautiful. Uh, it was a beautifully thrown ball as well. Let's give Matthew Stafford some credit there. But Marty... What did you think of Galladay's uh, rookie debut, so to speak? Well, the Galladay season is here, is it not? <laughs> it is. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of what 
we had talked about before. It's kind of I went back and I watched the last preseason game, and we were talking about you know was he ineffective due to design or or because they you know were, were double covering him. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot of a lot of what he was doing in that last game was he was if you watch he was blocking quite a bit. Mm-hmm. So either they were comfortable with his progression on the route tree or they just kind of figured he's good enough to learn it on the fly. But either way, you know, it's, it, you know, like I said last time, we, we got to calm down and we know it. We, we give this kid a chance and look what happened. He came out two touchdowns and what was it? 69 yards on four catches. Yeah. Something he, like that. Mm-hmm. He played really, he played really well. He, he did what we needed him to do. And of course, everybody's going to talk about, about his touchdowns and his big plays, but, I, it, we would be horrible, horrible at what we're doing if we did not mention the Herculean effort of Golden Tate. Ten catches, mm-hmm. 100, 107 yards or whatever it was. That guy, he, he couldn't be stopped. He just he could not be stopped. If he needed to catch the ball, he caught it. and That's exactly what we need out of Golden Tate. I was very, very impressed with, uh, with everything those guys did. Marvin Jones had his, what, one or two catches for a touchdown. But, yep. You know, he was he was almost an afterthought again. Uh, he he's beginning to worry me a bit, going back to last season. But hopefully, this is just more game plan. But uh, back to Galladay, you know, I was I was really really excited that he broke in the way he did. And I, I was gonna say to to champion Golden Tate a little bit. He was playing with a hurt hand too. I mean, there was yeah. I mean, you could see it. He his I believe it was his right hand was really bothering him, and and it didn't matter. St- like you said, still had. Over 100 yards receiving, 12 targets, caught 10 passes. But one thing that was interesting because it was something that we weren't sure what was going to happen. TJ Jones was still brought onto the roster. He wasn't cut. And Galladay played a lot more than TJ Jones. TJ Jones played basically late in the fourth quarter, and that was it. It wasn't exactly garbage time, but it was close to it. And it was just something that was interesting to see. Because you have a rookie, granted, you know, you wanted to see what he could do, and he had an impressive debut in the preseason, but TJ Jones also showed ability in the preseason as well. It was just kind of interesting to see that he was still buried, and it makes you wonder what exactly is going to happen with TJ Jones later on in the year, because Abadaris was a healthy scratch, didn't play, and they brought him onto the active roster they still have uh jace billingsley on the practice squad which i don't know how anyone at this point let him go through unclaimed on waivers after the lions after the uh cuts because this is a guy especially like new england this is a guy that could help out a patriots type offense a smaller guy who's who can get in and out of zones and i'm not saying he's wes welker i'm not saying he's julian edelman i'm saying he can play that type of role and still be productive out of it and that's if you were watching on Thursday clearly that was lacking in the Patriots offense and again the lines are fortunate that they still have Billingsley on the practice squad but it's it's just it's something that that's interesting because Marty you were you were astute when Robinson was picked up and we first heard from Jeff Schwartz that the Lions liked him not only as a tackle but as a guard. And you raised the question, and I'm going to give you a lot of props for this because you did. You raised the question unprovoked, what was going to happen of Lincoln Tomlinson because he's almost an afterthought. And sure enough, we know what happened. The Lions got rid of him. And it's just it's something that's kind of interesting to see what's going to happen because you called Abadaris. You said you were excited about that as well. What do, what do you take – with this still receiving battle that's going on, how do, how do you see it kind of playing out? Do you see the Lions maybe having to make a move of signing Billings, Billingsley onto the practice or, or from the practice squad onto the main roster because they need to protect him like they did with Rudock last year? How, how, how do you see this whole battle still kind of shaking out? I think it's a good possibility. Um, I, I think as far as TJ Jones go. The reason he was basically in "quote unquote" garbage times, I, I think they they pretty much know what they're going to get out of him. He's not spectacular, but he's also not terrible. He's good for the occasional nice play, but I think they know they feel they know what they're going to get out of him, and they wanted to see what Galladay could do because let's face it, he's a third round draft pick. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I forget who I saw it this weekend. I forget who it was. One of the one of the ESPN guys had said, you know, if if 
Galladay, I might not have even been this weekend, but they said if Galladay had gone to a bigger school, he probably would have been a first or second round talent because you know a pick because that's the kind of talent he has. But the fact that he went to Northern Illinois allowed Detroit to get him third round. You know, yeah. so I mean, he, he kind of, he was kind of quote unquote owed playing time ahead of T.J. Jones, who has who has done nothing with his with the time he's gotten. So I, I think that's why T.J. Jones has been. You know, I think that's why he was in mop up duty at the end of the game. But as far as Billingsley, I I think if anybody wanted him, they would have they would have grabbed him. Uh, I think the fact that nobody did grab him just kind of speaks volumes. I kind of think that you know he maybe maybe Billingsley's the kind of guy that's special and well, for lack of a better term, special. In he's competent in this offense. Mm-hmm. Is he going to be competent in New England's? Because I've heard I've read several things and I've heard other players say that the New England playbook for receivers, like the route tree, is very very difficult to grasp. Like even like when Chad Johnson was there, Chad Ochocinco, whatever you want to call him, you know the big the big knock on him was he had a lot of trouble grasping that playbook, and that's why he didn't or the route tree, and that's why he didn't play a whole lot when he was there. So I mean, it's you know maybe they looked at Billingsley and thought, you know what, we're good with what we have. I mean, it's kind of what Chris Hogan is, anyways. Mm-hmm. I, I I don't know. I um, but I think if I think if somebody wanted to grab him, Jacksonville even with Allen Robinson being hurt, I think if somebody wanted to grab him, they would have and. I, he's on their Lions practice squad for a reason. Yeah, no, it, definitely. It's just something that was, you know, kind of interesting. But going back to Greg Robinson, obviously, a lot of people were coming in with a little bit of skeptical optimism uh, after that signing because the bust, the the bust label was all over him. It really was, and and a lot of people were, you know, ready to write him off. He was already written off uh, by the Rams, and it was something that. Again, Jeff Schwartz said, well, if he's in Detroit, he could possibly flourish. Now, granted, he didn't necessarily flourish, but he still improved from the preseason. And in the preseason, he had some mistakes, but he wasn't, he wasn't bad by any means either. You know, Greg Robinson was very, very serviceable at left tackle, but Rick Wagner on the right side of the line was very, very impressive as well. Worth every bit, every penny, dime, nickel, quarter, of his contract. I mean, the fact Matthew Stafford was only sacked once, very uh, limited on pressure. The only interception that he threw, Golden Tate, was interfered with and held, and it wasn't called. Um, so Tate couldn't get to the ball. He was turned around on it. Outside of that, Matthew Stafford had a clean pocket, and he was able to, for the most part, dictate when he was going to throw the football. And those two guys were really, really important. The bookend guys played very, very well. Again, Robinson was still a pleasant surprise because I think, again, we're all kind of waiting with bated breath, thinking, okay, w- when is he going to screw up? When is he going to sc- like you know? When is he going to screw up? Is it going to be now? Is it going to be this play? Is he going to get blown up? Is it going to be on skates? Didn't really happen, and he faced a pretty good uh, pass rusher on Sunday, and it was just, it was just really, really interesting. Um, how those two fared. And again, the offensive line, granted the Lions didn't run the football very well. It's something that they're still trying to figure out, but granted Amir Abdullah is, you know, getting back in the swing of things, Theo Riddick getting back in the swing of things as well. So it's going to take some time for that to develop, but the offensive line didn't look bad. What were your thoughts on uh, the, the guys up front? No, I, I was pleasantly surprised as well. Uh, you know, um, we had talked about the offensive line potentially being an issue, and they looked more like a strength than anything. They looked they looked pretty solid. Um, they weren't. There was really no concerns, and you know, like you said, you know, Stafford pretty much had a clean pocket all day. Um, I want to say about the running game. You know, yeah, we, we've talked about in this podcast how it's not just the running backs to the offensive line. Well, let's not you know. Let's give the devil their due. Arizona's defense is staunch. They're a very good defense mm-hmm. that just happened to get caught out of place a little bit on Sunday. You know, um, Hassan Reddick was everywhere. I mean, you could not look at the the Cardinals without seeing Reddick's face. Yeah, just about in every play. So I mean, he was he was outstanding. Dansby was kind of an unheralded hero for them. He was he was solid in the middle. That defense looked really. And of course, Tyron Matthew was everywhere as well. Peterson looked a little lost at times. Did you uh, did you did you notice that too? Like Patrick Peterson looked like he was kind of like I don't know caught flat footed or lost a few times. A little bit. I mean, there was a couple of times when 
uh, he was on Jones and then on Tate where they got the better of him. But um, I know that on the Galladay touchdown, the 45-yard touchdown, um, the color guy, Daryl Johnston, thought that Peterson was on Galladay. And he even said, you know, I think Peterson should be on Galladay. Galladay's been, you know, kind of tearing it up as the Lions are scoring 20 points in the fourth quarter. Uh, but it was Mathis instead. I mean, I don't think I don't think that Peterson had a bad game per se. I thought he, I, I know he didn't have a great game. Don't get me wrong, or, or even a good game by any means. But he was still serviceable to the point where Matthew Stafford didn't seem to really test him all that much. I mean, it, a lot of his throws uh, were underneath. There wasn't a lot of deep throws that he wanted to you know test because. Even on Galladay's touchdown, there was bracket coverage every single time with the safety. So, yeah, it was that was just that was just kind of my thought. I mean, it just it looked uh, to me, it just looked like Patrick Peterson wasn't himself. But I mean, who knows? Yeah. Maybe I was wrong. I, it, that's that's also possible. But you know, I was just I was really really pleased with the way this game went. And like I said, we got to give the devil their due. Arizona's defense is really solid, so I, I think that plays a part in why Abdullah and Riddick really weren't all that great. And even when they brought in Dwayne Washington, even he wasn't, you know, they, they kept calling him the bigger bodied guy. They've been, well, it's not harder to be bigger than <laughs> Theo Riddick and, and Amir Abdullah. I mean, come right. on. But, uh, yeah, they, they made it sound like, well, they made it sound like, like Dwayne Washington was, was, was Adrian Peterson. Oh, he's a bigger bodied guy. Well, he's not that big, like settle down. But, um, you know, I think that's another reason the running game was, was kind of stagnant. It's Cause that defense was, was playing really strong for Arizona. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's, you know, they also – Detroit also didn't make anything happen either. Like, I think that there there was no long gains. There wasn't even really any respectable gains. They were kind of like two and three yarders for the most part. But, you know, that'll come in time. I, they'll, they'll be, I, they're will they'll they going to grow as a team. They're going to gel. And they're they're going to be better. I'm not saying they're going to be a great running team, but I think Detroit will get better. Yeah, hopefully, because out of the rushing yards that the Lions did have, basically Matthew Stafford – accounted for 15 of them. Casey Redford accounted for, uh, I think, 10 of them. So when you rush for 82 yards and two guys are basically a quarter of that, you're not doing good by any stretch of the imagination. For me, that was still a negative. I mean, we've talked about all these positives, and there's one more positive that you know I kind of want to get to, but it, w- it was just that, to me, that's what was the frustrating part. I mean, on 15 carries, Amir Abdullah only gets 30 yards. You know, granted, Dwayne Washington did better, six carries, 22 yards, but when you have a quarterback and a backup punter who, yeah, Casey Redford got injured, but when they account for 25 yards, you're not doing anything good. I mean, Matthew Stafford should never be one of your leading rushers. You know, and especially a punter shouldn't be someone getting a a quarter or a portion of the, of a quarter of your yards. That, that that's just a major red a red flag for me. I mean, granted, yes, the Lions are like the Saints; they're more of a passing offense. They don't like utilizing the run all that much. But Bob Quinn has said countless times that he wants to build a competent running game, and when you have your starting running back go for 15 carries for 30 yards. That's not a good start in doing it. Granted, yes, it was Amir Abdullah's first game back, but he did play in the preseason, and he didn't look that bad in the preseason, but on Sunday he didn't look great at all. I mean, he looked like a guy that was lost almost all the time. So for that, to me, that's a little concerning. But hopefully, Marty, you know, from your lips to God's ears, Maybe they start gelling. Maybe they start figuring it figuring it out. And the Lions are actually starting to get some sort of a running game. But one other positive that I wanted to get to, and it was something that when the Lions started to go on their little winning streak last year, they did something on defense that the Lions went back to on Sunday. And I, I think it's going to be something that we're going to be seeing a lot more of. And it's Miles Killebrew. In basically playing not only from the safety position, but kind of creeping up to the linebacking uh, position because it's something that was really, really inter- interesting. The Lions have not really used the th- their third linebacker. Par- Paul Warlow, who won the third linebacking job, only played 12 snaps. 
12 snaps. And Killebrew played 29, which is the most he's played. And it's something that when the Lions were on that little bit of a win streak and they were creeping up to even second in the NFC North, they did. They cut out their linebacking play and they only went with two linebackers and they moved basically. That's when Killebrew started to become an emergence. People were like, oh my God, that's right. This Miles Killebrew kid, the kid that, you know, I remember his highlight tape. tape. He was always hitting people hard. That's when you were starting to realize that Killebrew could actually bring something to the table. And it seemed like that's what the Lions were doing this Sunday as well. They wanted to get guys in, uh, you know, in space because they knew David Johnson could could hurt them. They knew, you know, Larry Fitzgerald, even though he's about ninety years old, can still be an effective threat. You still have John Brown, who's small but can stretch the field. You still have Jermaine Gresham, who was going to be a mismatch against anyone. Even Gerard Davis had a couple of times. Um, you know, he had trouble covering him. And and it was something that you needed to work with in space. So I thought that was really interesting. And again, Killebrew did not disappoint. He had a pick six and really contributed to this defense with, you know, three tackles, two uh, pass deflections, uh, one tackle for loss. And like I said, the, the pick six for a touchdown. So this guy from, what was it, Utah State? wasn't it? Yes. Something like that, where basically yes, coming out of nowhere, making an instant impact and still growing within his spot, which was interesting. And it, it was just, it was really pleasant to see because I think Killebrew is going to be that hybrid type guy that you always hear about, that hybrid nickel corner where, or like nickel safety, where if you're watching like NFL matchup or something like that, they always talk about the guy. He's the guy, if you're watching that on Sunday morning, uh, before a game that looks like a linebacker, but he's not. He's a safety moved up in the box because there's only two linebackers. It still looks like uh, like a. It looks more like a four three than a three four because of that. But you always see an extra down lineman instead. That's kind of one of the tells. It's almost like a five two, and it's just something that was really really interesting that they still went with that. And it's going to be interesting to see if the Lions do that continuing going forward. Um, but outside of that, was was there any other you know red flags for you that kind of uh, perked up outside of the running game? No, not particularly. Uh, I did want to give a, a shout-out to uh, Jamal Ag, but he looked spectacular at times on, on special teams. Like yeah. he, consistently, he consistently got good got return yardage. Uh, he was a pleasant surprise, and it's it's something that the Lions have kind of struggled with uh, special teams for the past couple of years. Like they'll they'll go for they'll have like one good guy for a year, and then they'll struggle. Hopefully, Agnew is going to be the guy for a while because yeah, the special teams actually look really competent. Uh, I'm a little concerned with the punting situation. We're on our third punter already yeah. with uh, Jeff Locke, who was signed today. You know, I, I'll give the kid I'll give Redfern credit. He he was trying to make something happen. He should have just let the ball roll out and taken the safety, but hindsight's twenty twenty. He wanted to help the team, and in doing so, he ended up getting just annihilated. Uh, and you know, you feel bad for a kid like that. But uh, no, no real red flags other than the run game. Yeah, and going back to the punter, as you said, Jeff Locke signed today, and we're not going to see Sam Mark- Martin until Week Eight when the Lions face the Pit- uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. He's still on the non-football injury list, so if he wasn't ready for this week. And if he wasn't activated, you have to sit the first six games of the year. So you're not going to see him until week eight. So that's going to be something that could be an Achilles heel, uh, you know, to the Lions. Because it's something that I, I know it sounds so cliche, but it's so true. There are three phases of every team, and special teams is one of them. Granted, um, when Prater was asked to punt, a couple of his first punts were not great. And then he and then he started to you know get into a rhythm and, and they started to be serviceable, but if you're ever thrust in that situation again, kind of screwed. I mean, it's something that, granted, you know, sometimes the Lions' offense doesn't do um, themselves any favors. They go sometimes quickly three and out, and you have to turn the ball back over on a punt. Well, you know, if you have a situation where you have a new punter in there, 
who's going to get pressured. He may fumble a snap or, you know, if he's just not comfortable, even though you think, well, sure, you receive said snap and you punt the ball away. Hopefully, knock on wood, that's all there is. But you never know. It's something where, I mean, even Casey Redford, you know, when he got hurt, kind of misplayed the snap a little bit and had to run or else it would have been a safety. So he was just saving two points, even though it ended his season. And one thing that was really interesting, too, kind of looking ahead to Monday, because that's right, the Lions are on Monday Night Football next week. The Giants, without Odell Beckham, looked terrible. They looked so bad, Marty. I don't know if, I don't know if you caught the game on uh, Sunday night against, against the Cowboys, but that Giants team, outside of their defense, did not look like they were any semblance of anything on offense. No, I, I didn't get to see any of it. But it's funny that you say that because they've got Ingram, who is mm-hmm. through four preseason games, and now this one, he's kind of looking like a complete tight end. Um, you got Brandon Marshall. You've got Sterling Shepard. I, I don't understand what I, I don't understand what the problem is. I mean, is is Odell Beckham that big of a of a missing piece for an offense with that much talent? I mean, it's just I don't know. It's it's really really weird, but. Um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing some of that game. I won't, I won't see much off the DVR and watch it on Tuesday but because uh, it starts at 8.30, and I'll, right. I'll be in bed for work. But uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the pageantry of a Monday night game. You know, they're starting to starting to give Detroit some primetime games, and that's always great. Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, it's something, too, that, you know, again, it, it was just – it the, the Giants don't really have a good running back. They don't have a good running game, and that was something that was interesting. And it's going to be interesting, too – to see if Eric Ebron and Brandon Fells become a little bit more targeted in the passing game, you know, to take advantage of the linebacking core mismatch mismatches that you can have on a, on a Monday night. But it was just, yeah, it was something that was really, really interesting. One thing that was also really interesting, because I don't know when the last time it happened, but the NFC North was one touchdown catch away in Chicago of being undefeated. And it's something that a lot of people, obviously, giving Green Bay their due, they are predicting, and right, again, rightfully so, the Packers to win the division. And everyone said, well, you know, Minnesota was going to come in second. And, again, through no fault of their own, because it's Detroit, let's be honest. Detroit was an afterthought, and Chicago, everyone know, knows, is rebuilding. But Mike Glennon late in the fourth quarter, had two touchdown passes. One was dropped um, by a a receiver, and then the other one was dropped by Jordan Howard right before the goal line. And granted, he was about to get hit, but it still hit him in the hands, and he was going to fall into the end zone after the hit anyways. And it just didn't happen. It didn't materialize in any way, shape, or form. But the NFC North is looking really, really competitive. I don't know if you saw any of Mon- of the Monday night games last night, but Minnesota against the Saints, that defense still looks very, very good, You know, still very, very aggressive. Sam Bradford played out of his mind uh, on Monday night. Dalvin Cook looked like the real deal. It was something that I know it was kind of maybe painful for people who wanted the Lions to draft a running back, to watch Kareem Hunt go nuts on Thursday and then Dalvin Cook on Sunday basically destroy their competition. It was something that Dalvin Cook, for a Vikings rookie, broke Adrian Peterson's record. Adrian Peterson had, in a rookie debut, 107 yards from scrimmage. And Dalvin Cook had, I believe, 113. So you look at that, and that's and that's pretty good company just right off the bat. And those were two people that I know for a fact a lot of Lions fans wanted. So there might have been a little bit of a knife twist in there if you were watching on Sunday. But the NFC North looks tough. And as we've said, the Lions' schedule doesn't look easy. I mean, it's something that if you go back to it and if you look at it, the Giants, you know, with o- without Odell Beckham, possibly they're beatable. You know, you still have the Falcons at home. Vikings are going to be tough. Panthers are going to be tough. The Saints didn't look like anything special. That looked like there was going to be a win anyways before you face the Steelers on Sunday night football right before Halloween. That looks like a tough game too. So, you know, it's something that you 
with the competitiveness of the NFC North, you're going to need to probably go four and four in your first eight if you want to really compete. Because I didn't really see any like there wasn't really a drop off with the Packers losing TJ Lang or anything like that. And again, the Vikings looked really really good. So outside of that, what did you like? Just kind of looking through the league, was there anything else that kind of surprised you? Because that's what was surprising to me is that the NFC North was two seconds away from being an undefeated division. Uh, this one didn't surprise me. It just kind of disappointed me was how shoddy Le'Veon Bell looked for the Steelers. Now, I know he, he sat out the entire preseason and, you know, he's doing his his rap on why he wants $17 million a year, blah, blah, blah. But I thought he'd at least come in ready to play. He'd at least come in in football shape. Mm-hmm. And it was – don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, he's, he's, not saying he's, in, he's not in shape, but uh, he didn't look ready. He didn't look like he was ready for, for week one action. He didn't look like he was ready for the hits. I'm hoping this is just kind of like a rarity and that he that he wakes up because he's one of the guys that is fun to watch. You know, Again, the Steelers aren't my team, but I do enjoy watching him play. There's guys scattered throughout the league who I look forward to watching, and he's one of them. Um, so I'm hoping that this is just kind of like a knock the rust off kind of thing. Because, I mean, let's face it, Cleveland, even though the scoreboard was close, that game should not have been as close as it was. Cleveland's not quite there yet. And the and the Steelers, I almost said the Pirates, uh, the Steelers should have blown their doors off. And they, they really, really struggled. So I'm hoping that uh, Le'Veon Bell gets that rust knocked off. And other than that, man, I you know this was this was a really enjoyable first opening weekend. Yeah, I mean, it was something just, you know, going back to it, I mean, you saw Jacksonville having 10 sacks. I mean, they looked incredible. Granted, you don't know how uh, how long that's going to last. You know, Houston immediately moving away from Tom Savage, going to Deshaun Watson really, really quickly in a half. I mean, there, there was a lot of interesting, interesting things going on, but quickly going back to it, um, Tony Dungy had a tweet where, he basically was saying this is why the the NFL has to go to two preseason games and an 18 game schedule was because everyone looked so rusty. And I was thinking to myself yes. and I'm just like I'm thinking to myself I'm like that doesn't make sense because the preseason is not for your is not really for your starters. It's for the rest of your roster. You have to build out a 53 man roster and you can't just do that looking at two guys or uh, two games you know worth of tape on guys it just it's it was something that didn't make sense it was something that i know a lot of teams now want their guys to be healthy for week one instead of getting injured in the preseason but injuries are going to happen regardless it, it's it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when now, you can protect your players all you want to week one, but if they still get injured in week one, which we saw a couple of injuries in week one, uh, like Deontay Hightower, um, as, as you said, Allen Robinson, they're out for the year. You know, it, even going with Edelman again, you know, getting injured, he got injured in the third preseason game. You know, injuries happen. You can't, you can't really safeguard yourself against injuries in a violent game. And I don't, I just, I don't know what Tony Dungy was thinking when he was thinking, oh yeah, go to two preseason games and just play your starters in the first two weeks. That does the other half of that roster a great disservice. You know, because with the 53-man roster, you still need 33 guys to, to square that out, to be your backups, specialists, you know, reserves that you need in case there are injuries. And if you don't have tape on them, if you don't know how they react in situations, you're just as screwed. So, I mean, at least for me, when I when I read that, when I saw that, it didn't make any sense at all. Does that make sense to you, you know, just what Tony Dundee was thinking? Or, or are you in kind of – and it's okay if you disagree. I mean, you're more than welcome to, obviously. But – what were your thought process when you just heard me say that? Because to me, it sounds crazy. It, uh, that, that's because it is. I mean, <clears throat> I understand everybody's thinking, oh, we hate preseason football. It's stupid. And I've said the same thing. Like, oh, well, it's preseason. Who cares? Like, it's you know what you're going to get out of your starters for the most part. 
you need that. You, you need those preseason games to see what the other guys can do. You know, in in Jacksonville's case, they needed those four games to to see who the quarterback was going to be because you know heading into week four of the preseason, it, it looked like it was Chad Henney's job to lose. Mm-hmm. You know, and, yeah. and it looked like um, it looked like Bortles was going to be riding the pine. So I mean, it was just some teams just they need those four games. And let's face it, you don't want to. The 18 game season, I don't want to say it's never going to happen, but I don't see the NFLPA allowing that to happen because you figure you've got a 16 game, you got the four preseason games, the 16 game season, and then potentially four playoff games. I mean, that's that you're looking at that's what 20, 24 games already. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I guess you'd still be a four. I guess you'd still be a 24 than 18 game season, but I, I just don't see it happening because the NFLPA. They don't just represent the superstars. They represent the guys who are sitting on the bench too. So I, I just it, it didn't make any sense to me when you were when you were talking about it. Uh, it just I don't know. It just seems kind of silly to me. It does. I mean, granted, yeah, the, the amount of games doesn't change, but the thing that does change is that two of those games actually now mean something. You know, the fourth preseason game, you rest everyone anyways, so. You're basically throwing that one away for your starters anyways because you do. You want to evaluate everyone else to see if they deserve a roster spot. So really, yeah, you're you're looking at 23 games if you're basing it off that evaluation, which, again, it doesn't make sense. I mean, you have to prepare these guys and run these guys no matter what in training camp and in and, and preseason so that in week one comes out, you're – closer to mid-season form than not so that was just something that at least for me was really really interesting was some teams looked you know they looked like they didn't miss a beat Oakland for example looked really really good on Sunday and and Tony Romo if there's a clip a two-minute clip of it on Twitter he was interesting as heck if you listen to that clip find it guys it, it is you're gonna laugh because Tony Romo I think he's going to be more of a detriment in the booth only for the reason that he could tell you exactly after the quarterback yells something like, you know, California, California. Immediately Tony Robo's like, oh, they're going to run to the left. And then sure enough, the team runs to the left and you're like, uh, okay. And then two plays later in this clip, I, I swear to God, it's hysterical. You hear someone else yell like, like, skidoo, skidoo. He's like, okay, it's still going to be the same play, just ran to the right side. Sure enough, running play to the right side. So, like, all of these, you know, all of these calls, Tony Romo is just nailing it. And it was just hysterical. Jim Nance is like, how do you know this? And he's like, well, 14 years of studying football, Jim. It's just, it's just that easy. Like, he was calling things before they happened, and it was a lot of fun. So, I, I, I'm hoping... Jim Nance and Tony Romo calls the Lions Thanksgiving game because if that's on CBS, that's going to be a fun uh, Thanksgiving Thursday. But outside of that, that's all the topics I have. Marty, is there anything else that uh, you want to bring to the table or you want to call it a day? No, I don't have anything, man. I'm good. All right. Well, before we wrap up, obviously here on Lions SRD, we support all of the shows here on Sports Radio Detroit that we have. The Laugh Tracks, they do movie reviews. They just did It, which – I saw on Sunday. That's why I didn't watch the Lions live. Really, really good. Chapter two is going to be interesting whenever that comes out because this it is only the first chapter. Um, we have the wrestling fans. Obviously, me and Marty are on that. So is Adam Strangest. We're, we talk our guilty pleasure in professional wrestling, and it's, yes, still real to us, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but you also have Tigers SRD. You have Out of Bounds. Spinning the wheels is going to be coming back up. Hockey season's right around the corner. There's a prospect uh, tournament going on right now uh, that the Wings are a part of. So hockey season's right around the corner. The SRD Roadshow every Saturday, followed by the uh, Tailgate Saturday with Jeremy Stover. Jeremy Stover's also on Mitten Sports Talk with Eric Lehman and Roger Castillo on Sundays from 10 to noon. So if you want to listen to some football uh, talk before... The games kick off at 1 o'clock. You can do that. You can listen to that live at crbradio.com. If you want to listen to it later, just right here on sportsradiodetroit.com. And if you love football, we are the official home of Wine.Football. Uh, all their home games called here by yours truly. So you can catch them live if you just click on the little Bears icon when the games are on. And you'll be hearing this voice calling football games. So, 
We have you covered from top to bottom, left to right. If there's not something on this network, I guarantee you're not looking hard enough because we have a lot. So outside of that, I'm Ben Salagi. I'm Marty Stouffer. And we say goodnight. night.